Hey everyone, thank you for having me. I requested to be able to stand over here for the short people reason. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful. It at least helps me orient. A little bit about me. I feel like I come here today wearing several hats. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about each of them to give us some context. I got into this world firstly as a dog person. So my job, my primary job still today is in the dog world. So I run a nonprofit headquartered out of North Carolina that nationally serves people who are needing service or facility dogs. So I run that entire nonprofit kind of as my first baby. And then as part of that nonprofit, we have partnered with the University of North Carolina Wilmington to have an academic program that is a community partnership with Paws for People that allows us to utilize the college students, undergraduates primarily, to help in one phase of our training of those service and facility dogs. And that has evolved into becoming a minor at our university that I will tell you a bit more about. And then I also am a very big proponent of accreditation in our canine industry. So it when Dr. Yordi was talking, it kind of made me think when she was first speaking about was what she was originally doing with her therapy dog, perhaps the best way of doing it or the most ethical. And I think what often has evolved to set that apart is the formality, the proper training structure. And I'm a really big proponent for accreditation in our industry to guarantee that things are being done with the best interest of both the humans that we're serving and the dogs that we're placing. So in that role, I have become more active in Assistance Dogs International, which is the leading accrediting body in our industry. And I am currently the chairperson of the Standards Committee, as well as an accreditation assessor. So I get the privilege of traveling around the country, visiting other programs and doing their five-year accreditation audit. So I feel like I've developed a really unique network of seeing how other people uh, are employing these dogs so brilliantly. So I'm really excited to kind of talk to you about how those things all mesh together today. So with hope that this wonderful tech team has helped me problem solve, I'm hoping that my next slide will play well. And I'm going to take a, a brief pause from the mic and tell you a few stories um, about what we do. My name is Ava Smith. This is my dog Daphne, and she's a medical alert and physical assistance dog. When I was 12, I was in perfectly fine physical condition and literally just one morning, completely out of the blue, I woke up with a lot of seizure-like symptoms. My left arm vibrated all day and it just got worse until my entire body was basically having an ongoing seizure and they attempted to uh, stop it and instead paralyzed my entire body except for my right arm. I was in the Army. I joined in 99, and September 11th hit, and we were deployed to the Pentagon for remains recovery. And then it was off to Afghanistan for nine months for combat operations. And, you know, I dove myself into work. Um, I self medicated a little bit. And one day I realized that I was going to lose my career and my family, so I stopped drinking. The problem with that is everything starts to come flooding in. Well, we brought Anna home from China when she was a year and a half old. And when we met her, she was um, very developmentally delayed. She had been uh, pretty much neglected. She was way behind. She couldn't sit up. She couldn't crawl. She couldn't pick up a Cheerio and put it in her mouth. She, she didn't cry. She just was pretty lifeless. I mean, I hated everything. My anxiety was constantly through the roof. I was insanely depressed. Like, life was not looking good. Anna's problem is so deep. It's so deep in her heart. Those attachment issues. Why, why did somebody give me away? Why didn't my birth mother want to keep me? Are you going to give me away? I didn't have much of a, uh, 
a direction or a purpose. The training with Pause for People allowed me to stay focused on my own recovery because it would have been easy to turn back to drinking and just bury myself back in my house, which I didn't do. And that has really kept my head up. A word we like to use is, you know, transformed. I've, I've gone from that to a point where I have a purpose of coming here every month. I benefit from it, so the, the, the payout is already there. And it's a continuous payout at this point. I transformed from someone who hated everyone, everything. I didn't want to wake up in the morning and I didn't want to keep living an unfair life. Someone who's happy to wake up in the morning and see the life I'm living now. She's my best friend. And um, she really changed everything for me. I play the violin and I have a YouTube channel and it strings in the front room. Boss is a nice dog and I like him very much because he helps me with anxiety, anxiety and he interrupts negative behaviors. Moss just gives her that here I am and we can bond without any words and I'm not going to leave you, and I see you get upset, and I'm going to come and be there for you. He's my service dog as well, so at the end of the day, after he's put Anna to bed, then he comes to comfort me. So he's a great addition to our family. He's so sweet, Paws. Moss, I love you. Paws for people, they're with you the whole time, and they see you, you know, at your worst and at your best. They give you a dog that they know is going to save your life. They are a family and you know you can always get an answer from someone or just someone to listen to you. This change is probably the only reason I'm alive and I think everyone should have the opportunity to live a life they find worth living. So sometimes when I watch that I can, still can't believe that's um what I get to do. It's pretty humbling, but I thought that it was a more powerful way to share a few stories of what our end goal is with the little puppies that, that you saw running around. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of different volunteers to make that result happen. So just a little bit of background about this organization. Uh, we were founded in 1999, originally for about the first 10 years of our existence, we focused in being a local group of volunteers who were getting our dogs certified to be therapy dogs to make visitations and help in a lot of the ways that you've heard and seen some of the dogs here today doing. And there came a point during my time in undergrad where we had the opportunity to begin a program in correctional facilities and having that program allowed us to make the shift to training very highly skilled dogs who learn tasks to mitigate disabilities. So we work still with the correctional facilities. And then what we found was we created our own bottleneck. So I guess that's entrepreneurship in action. Um, you kind of grow until there's a problem and then you figure out how to solve the problem. And the problem was that we had these amazing inmate trainers who became extremely skilled dog trainers and we're teaching dogs extremely sophisticated chains of behavior. And then it was time to take those adolescent dogs and get them to perform those same behaviors 
out in the world and generalize that behavior as they matured so that they could have public access. Because as we'll talk about in a minute, if dogs are certified as service dogs, which is a very specific legal definition, then they can go anywhere to accompany their client. And so there's a limitation because those trainers who are incarcerated could not help us with that final step of training, that public access training. So we now only had a few volunteers to try and we created a backlog of skilled dogs. And so in trying to solve that, um, I thought, well, university students would be the perfect demographic because these dogs are already now trained and behaving, but they need to do that final maturation out in the world. And who is going more places and doing more things than an undergraduate college student? So it was a way that we could marry the different lifestyles and different skills that people have and utilize them for a certain portion of training that was appropriate. So because of that change, we re-headquartered to Wilmington, North Carolina, because we were able to, um, after many years going through the uh, instructional uh, committees and all the curriculum committees, we were able to get a pilot program started. So I transitioned to Wilmington to lead those pilot trial courses. And after two years of trial courses, they gave us permanent course status. So we are now going through our 13th academic year at UNC Wilmington. Um, and we are accredited, as I mentioned earlier, by both Assistance Dogs International and Animal Assisted Intervention International. What do we look like in terms of size, scope, and reach? Uh, when I made this slide a few weeks ago, we had 66 dogs in training. That fluctuates all the time. It just had six more. So anywhere from birth until almost ready to earn their vest, we probably have anywhere around the neighborhood of 75 dogs at any one time under our care and training status. And then we have currently 256 dogs who are placed and actively working in their careers. We do place dogs nationwide and in Canada. And then over a course of our history since 1999, we've had 1,500 plus dogs be certified at any given time until their retirement and ultimate passing. We have an assistance dog graduation rate of about 85%. And that's something I'm very proud of because we have constantly altered and shifted and course corrected our training approaches and programs because we're striving for graduation into a job. So uh, I often have the opportunity to try to explain that um, we are not a dog rescue organization, as you've seen from our puppies. And when we get a chance for questions, I'd be happy to to answer anything about that, but I think of us as a people rescue organization. And so the mark of our success is how many dogs who begin our training program ultimately get placed into a job. Pet placements, we need them for the dogs who choose not to have a career. However, um, we should not have more pet placements than we have working dog placements, or we'd be doing something wrong managerially. And considering we function on Corporate sponsors, the generosity and donations of individuals and grants, I take it very seriously what the return on investment to those donors is, and that's our success rate. So just to give you an idea, industry standard success rate uh, usually floats around 45 to 60% in accredited organizations in our industry. So us getting kind of over that 80 rate is something that is a big accomplishment for us. And then financially, our overhead percentage stays under 5% for that um, kind of donor ROI. You saw a few examples of, of what kind of dogs we're placing in the video. Uh, the first example that comes to mind typically for people in our industry are guide dogs. We do not do dogs to help with guide work or people with low vision. I kind of like to sum it up that we do everything else. So mobility assistance dogs, dogs working with people who typically are utilizing a wheelchair uh, is the most classic first type of service dog kind of born out of that guide dog model. We do place those. Sensory development, tactile pressure is our fancy terminology for autism spectrum disorder assistance dogs. Psychiatric medical alert is what is in the biggest demand. Right now is what we receive the most inquiries and applications for. We do place psychiatric service dogs with people who have been in military service and experienced combat trauma. However, we place an equal number of psychiatric service dogs with civilians who have experienced other types of trauma and first responders. That makes us a bit unique because the vast majority of programs right now are still limiting their placements 
to veteran PTSD solely due to the demand. Allergen detection and diabetic alert and hearing alert, those three are a little more niche. We do only a few of them here and there because it takes a really, really unique dog to thrive at those things. But allergen detection could be for someone with anaphylactic reaction to anything like peanuts, tree nuts, latex, seafood. So we're really doing scent training on the dog, but then deploying that dog that has to behave at the level of a service dog. Um, they can't be highly aroused and go, 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 like a typical scent dog would be for like narcotics, bomb detection, anything like that. So it's pretty unique. And then that incident response category I skipped over briefly just kind of sums up any other medical needs someone might have. So a lot of times that looks like someone who is seeking support for seizure response for epilepsy, could be narcolepsy, could be other um, cardiac issues, maybe such as POTS, anything that makes their handler either become unresponsive or become in danger and need to seek assistance and allowing them to go out independently means that if they have a service dog with them, they could still get medical help if they needed. Through technology, the dog pushes the button and gets help when needed. So those are pretty cool. And then a big love and passion of mine are facility dogs. So a lot of what was spoken about earlier today is very parallel to the level of facility dog. So facility dog is a dog who is paired with a professional and then does animal assisted interventions with that professional in their work setting. So we really like to find unique placements. We really pride ourselves on that. Um, some of the placements I could mention for you would be placements with speech language pathologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, mental health counselors, um, and then some of the more unique ones, we have some athletic trainers at the NCAA level who have uh, dogs for rehabilitative purposes. We have some dogs who are working in, you might have heard of like courthouse dogs, so dogs who are working with like victims pre-trial and then throughout a trial, especially with like district attorney's offices. And then a really blossoming area with a lot of demand right now are dental office assistance dogs. Um, because of the level of dental anxiety and the number of people who are not seeking proactive dental health support. Um, actually, if the dogs are taught to perform deep pressure therapy during someone's appointment and also desensitized to all the equipment that the dentists might be using around, they found a really, really good success, especially in pediatric dentistry with utilizing that. And then we have some dogs in oncology units and those types of things. We also do place emotional support dogs. Those dogs, as we will get into, have no vest and go nowhere in public because legally they should not, cannot, and under my watch will not. Um, but we do place that if a dog shows us that they have a lot of potential to provide support and do tasks, but they don't enjoy and thrive in the stress of being out in a public setting. So getting into that then a little bit, I just have two slides of definitions, which I'm so passionate about. I think we're entering a time when these phrases and terminology are being used more carefully, but unfortunately, especially in writing, these things are often used interchangeably, kind of to try to find variety when in fact they are not interchangeable terms. So especially as um, clinicians, healthcare professionals, future healthcare professionals, whoever you may be in this room, I think it's really important to be among the group of people who are using these terms accurately because it matters in my industry, but also it matters legally. So service dog would be what would typically be considered your top tier. A service dog, the definition is actually set forth by US federal law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, no one else really has a say in what the definition is. So no group, no entity, ADI, no one is getting creative with this. It is set forth in our country by law. And that law dictates that a service dog must be a dog who is specially performed, specially trained, excuse me, to perform tasks that assist a person with a disability. That is it. So it goes on to give a lot of examples and do's and don'ts and those sorts of things. But what it comes down to is a dog wearing a vest, going into public with other consumers is only allowed to do so if the person they are with holding their leash needs trained tasks to mitigate a disability. In no other context is it appropriate to use the term service dog. That being said, service dogs are 100% allowed in public, should be treated and respected well in public, 
and should only and can only be asked to leave if they misbehave or disrupt business in any way. So unfortunately, that is a pretty vague access definition for dogs to be on public transportation, in retail environments, in restaurants, and it can be quite easily taken advantage of and misused. So I think that is the problem that is plaguing access laws right now. But the only two questions that can be asked are, is this your service dog? And what tasks does it perform? Now kind of by default, if you answer what tasks does it perform, you are giving some disclosure about your disability. People are going to have contextual cues to your disability. Um, but what cannot be said in response to the question, what tax does it perform, are it helps with my anxiety. It's not a task. Provides emotional support. That's not a task. Makes me feel better. Helps me be here. None of those are a task. So especially when we think about invisible disabilities, disabilities that are not easily observed, uh, the large demand for psychiatric service dogs that I told you about, there's a lot of gray area there, but the task that a psychiatric service dog would perform would be preventing or interrupting negative or disruptive behaviors. They prevent me or alert me before I have a panic attack. They interrupt and help me come back from a flashback. They provide deep pressure therapy to me while I am experiencing debilitating anxiety. Those types of things that are actionable terms that the dog had to be trained to do and doesn't simply do just because of the magic of being a wonderful dog um, are what really constitutes psychiatric service dog tasks. Emotional support animals, that term has unfortunately started to be used a little bit liberally and taken advantage of but what it truly means is that there is a medical necessity for having the emotional support and companionship that a dog can provide. A lot of places have limited this to dog now and taken away that animal term, for instance, airlines, but it could still be technically in a lot of places, any species, but this dog um, really doesn't need a vest because they're not going anywhere legally where they would need identification to gain entry to anywhere. They really only have fair housing rights in the US. So they're allowed to reside somewhere regardless if there's a no pet policy, a breed restriction, a size restriction. They don't pay a pet fee, they don't pay a pet deposit. So it helps you be able to have the dog live with you in order to be your emotional support, but not then take that dog to work or out in public or to doctor's appointments or anywhere like that. And actually just this past year, emotional support dogs have been eliminated from the Air Carriers Act. So only trained service dogs who meet that aforementioned ADA definition can now fly in the cabin outside of a carrier um, underneath a seat and they do require verification and paperwork ahead of time to prove that it's a service dog and not an emotional support dog. So there are some trends going towards tighter governance of the difference between these levels of training. And then a facility dog, as I mentioned before, they're also specially trained. Most of them are also task trained to be able to do things on cue that help whatever population they're going to serve. These dogs are being handled most often by a human service or a medical professional, and they're doing targeted and measured animal assisted interventions within the workplace. These dogs don't have any legal jurisdiction or access. Um, just to use Dr. Scott as an example, because I don't think she'll mind, she knows that Bella is not entitled to come wherever she wants her to go. However, she is coming to the university at the invitation, permission, and pleasure of the university as part of her job. So that's what makes it different. Um, you would not be going to Target with a facility dog unless you are doing community-based therapy as a therapist and your clients are with you going to target as a therapeutic part of their care plan. So that's the only time there's a little tiny smidgen of crossover as a facility dog might have public access if part of their job is doing community-based activities, but their handler just after work wouldn't be running into target and taking the dog in with them. And then a therapy dog, as we've talked about earlier today, can be a pet or a specially trained dog 
that is going to do animal, typically animal assisted activities and maybe doing shorter, shorter bursts of time typically. But I think typically the distinction between a facility dog and a therapy dog often comes from whether they were trained by and provided by a program or whether they were maybe in a community-based program. Both have to have uh, the invitation to come, both have to have permissions, both can do either animal assisted activities or therapy or education. So a lot of times it is whether it's a duration or whether that person is doing it as part of their employment or whether they're doing it as a volunteer that can create the distinction in those terminologies. So then lastly, a little bit about our program with our students then. How does this cross over into college life and what have we found in doing so? I mentioned earlier kind of why we thought that we needed to utilize this population. What, what it looks like now is that it has a base of four courses. So we are housed in the Recreation Therapy Department of our College of Health and Human Services, but our program is open to students of all majors. We also have graduate students and non-traditional students. So it is very diverse. Students start with an introductory course, which is fairly large for our university size, and it just covers the intro. A lot of what we've talked about today, rights and legislation, proper terminology, different types of service dogs, the history of how they were developed and who's credited for that. All the things you would expect of an intro course. They next matriculate onto class two, which then becomes centered in dog body language, psychology, and training theory. So that typically means that they wish to take the whole program if they engage in class two, but it's still a seated class. Um, there's really no dogs to, to be talked about yet. They're still trying to earn that. There are a few days of class two when our dogs come to class and we start practicing leash handling, cue giving, proper reinforcement, right? All those things, but it's only for that hour and a half of class. Ooh, I'm burning out the mic. It's only for that hour and a half of class. Um, so we have two semesters with them seated courses to qualify to get into what's really coveted and unofficially known as the dog classes, which are levels three and four. And in levels three and four, we have dogs who come out of that prison training program. So they're all roughly on average 12 to 14 months old. And they're being assigned to the college students who are then in a very measured and titrated way, learning how to take those dogs to various places in public and start to reinforce the type of behavior and performance we need. At the same time, we're doing, kind of over on the Pause for People side, we're doing the matching process of who those dogs are going to go to. And then the students are assigned and worked with to do the things that are needed to customize them for the recipient that we've chosen. So we really do figuratively and literally take them come kind of gen ed learning in high school, if you will, at the prison program and move them literally to college where they're figuratively also choosing their major and specializing in that thing and honing in on those skills. Students do that for two semesters because the level of independence and autonomy and assignments grow throughout those two semesters. In the final part of their classes, they're able to come to team training, work with those recipients and help be part of giving that dog over to the person that it's going to and being part of the test out process. So they really get that full circle experience and the closure that comes with that. And then if they choose to get declare the minor so that it shows up on their transcripts, there's also a fifth class which focuses solely on facility dogs and animal assisted intervention. And they can do that anytime while they take class three, four, or after um, where they take their other coursework to graduate. So completion of that earns them a certificate from us as Pulse for People. So it's an ADI credentialed certificate in public access training in the assistance dog industry and then also their minor, of course. Um, the minor only got declared in 2021, and since then we've had 85 total completions of the minor. So that's our new tally is, is the minor completions. We have some other metrics here to give you an idea. Students com completing the intro class um, was 1,600. Enrollment over all classes just short of 3,000 before this fall sem or spring semester. Students completing the certificate when it was only a certificate program back when it was just four classes was 380 and now we've tacked on that um, accredited minor. So we're up to 85 who've completed since that declaration. 
We have had many students um, cycle through working with us after their graduation in some capacity. But as you'll see, that number is only 28. Like we're not trying to make dog trainers out of people who otherwise had already chosen a university and declared a major of study. So typically we're getting a lot of people who finish the program who are in some type of human service field. They know that there's going to be crossover between the demographic that they choose to work with and the kind of consumers that we have in the service dog world. And they're really just wanting to diversify and add in that animal assisted intervention into their experience and how they can differentiate and market themselves. So we have a lot of obviously recreation therapy undergraduates because that's our department. They typically go on to either a master's in rec therapy program or a PT or OT. We have a lot of special education students, psychology, gerontology. I will tell you those make up the biggest populations of our interest. And then I always have my token business students, film studies students, and a little bit of everything else sprinkled in because uh, they just found a way where they could make dogs part of college. So who wouldn't want that, right? Um, 201 campus events last year. So as especially Dr. Yordi and Scott were alluding to their involvement across the campus community and how it can make an impact across the entire campus. Um, we can't keep up with the invitations we get to please come to uh, de-stress before midterms and finals and at our care counseling center and with athletics before their big games and with the university 101 classes and la, 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 la. So we are very well at this point. It took a while, it took a while for the inter-campus culture to change, but we are now very well engrossed and do about 200 events per year outside of our coursework with the dogs on campus with different departments. So trying, trying my best to elevate myself to come near the rest of these esteemed presenters today. I too, thanks to my colleagues at UNCW, have started to get some data about our program. And what they wanted to look at was what impact is this having on the students who take part in it? Um, it was just a little bit of a different angle because to our knowledge, we remain the only university with a for credit academic aspect to a service dog training program. There's some other universities, of course, with some coursework, um, with some specializations or who formally have a program where their students can be puppy raisers for service dog programs. But this is the only minor that we are yet aware of. So what our leadership wanted to do was look into what impact that's having on our students and the campus at large after about 10 years of, of getting some street cred there at the university. They wanted to see how they could kind of measure and quantify what might be happening there with our campus community. So Dr. Demetrio, um, her work is in analysis through microaffirmations. So taking the way that people state and word things in their feedback, assigning quantitative measures to that, and then getting data out of that. So of course, this was all still remains very new to me and very impressive, but they, um, she and our associate dean compiled a lot of the feedback. So let's say some feedback such as this from our class three and four students. They're given very open-ended prompts as part of their end of class assessments. Um, tell us about experiences, those types of things. And as she looks at them, she assigned some common themes to them and then started to see if those themes were reoccurring amongst students. So for example, some of her measurements are um, being in the present, affirming purpose and intention, feeling seen and heard, these micro-affirmations that make people be part of a community and therefore are shown to decrease depression, anxiety, isolation, right? So, for example, she found that out of all of the micro-affirmations that were coded from, this was two years worth of student feedback, she was able to break them into these um, reoccurring themes. And it shows that this program in and of itself is promoting a strong sense of belonging, um, supporting development of trust and advancing hope, which to my understanding and her work across different campuses are things that the department and the student success are really looking to increase to help with, of course, recruitment retention and graduation. So we're really excited about that. So my charter now to you all, as I told you a lot of what I hope is at least somewhat novel things about 
the service dog industry, about marrying that with undergraduates. And I'm hoping that that leads to you having several questions so that I can find out what you would like to know a little bit more about with the rest of my few minutes that remain. So does anyone have, even if it's a dog question, what, what might come to mind? Anything? Yes, Anne? Okay, about the innate trainers. So puppies graduate, do they get like updates on the puppies? Yes, so a little bit about how our inmate training program works. Our program at Foster People is broken into three phases. Puppy development, so all of the breeding, the early neonates, and then the puppy development up until 20 weeks all happens at our campus facility under our management. So the puppies live with us until they're about five months old. They do all of that early sensory development and exposure which is crucial because in dog development, about the first 16 weeks is all you get for imprinting on the brain, and then it closes. So we keep them out with us for that purpose, and they have a very rigid schedule of going certain places during certain weeks of development. So think they go to Target, they go to the fire department, they go to the police station, they do a lot of things in a very targeted order so they're exposed to things that help lower their stress in the future. So that's why we have dogs who are pretty calm out in the world, no matter what they encounter. Then they go to the prison program. So the inmates take these very well socialized puppies and they're in charge of putting the 120 plus cues on those dogs over about the course of nine months. So how our programs work, we have male and female. The dogs rotate amongst in no regimented schedule. So every month we have what we call a furlough trip and our vehicles move the dogs either from Wilmington to a facility or from one facility to another or from the facilities back down to Wilmington for some time out. So every dog is assessed as an individual, very big on Lima, least invasive, minimally aversive, and every dog is assessed as an individual. No one does the same thing just because they're the same age. So whether we think a dog is going to thrive best at our medium female facility or a low male facility or a medium male facility or need some time back out in Wilmington in a home. It's all an individual assessment. So no one inmate keeps a dog for like a year and a half and gets just attached to one dog. They're all working as a team and the dogs are constantly moving. And then we have weekly training calls with every correctional facility and they get a master update on all the dogs. And then our inmates also get to zoom in to our annual graduation. So they get to watch the dogs that they all worked hard on and care about walk across the stage. And it's the closest we can get them to being there with us, but they do get that. And then um, often we have clients who come on and zoom on those weekly training calls a year later and want to tell them how great things are going. So we really keep, we keep that whole cycle going. So they really feel connected as, as much as we can, they feel connected to the things that they've done and been a part of. Yeah, it's super important to the whole rehabilitative aspect. Could be an entire lecture on just the rehabilitative aspect of those correctional programs for sure. Title of the role of the assessor. The title of the role of the assessor? Uh, Assistance Dogs International Accreditation Assessor. For the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's, so in that role you go and assess programs. So just as this university is accredited, um, and accreditors come and review all the things for curriculum. Uh, we go internationally to every program at least once every five years and do an on-site visit. No one, it's not just a paperwork process to be accredited. So everyone gets a full on-site audit, um, client interviews, employee interviews, dog training assessment and observation, veterinary interviews, the whole nine, so they can be accredited. How about the dog assessment? When you see it, you know, what kind of Dog. What is that role called? Hmm. Dog assessor? You know, the one that you said the dogs assess to see if they can. Our trainers do that. Yeah, our training team does that. And then in order for our dogs to pass and go into any of those careers, I went over each of those careers has a standardized test. Um, and the dog, our dogs have to pass that test once a year, every year that they remain working and certified uh, in person. So fourth quarter, we have a team that goes across the country to testing sites and every dog comes and takes a test. We see if they're healthy, if they're groomed, if they're fat, if they're begging for food, if, they're, if any of the quality control has slipped, and then those dogs will be placed in remediation if needed. So there's a lot of, the follow-up is the biggest part. I mean, we hope these dogs go out and work for 10 years. So they're in training with us for about a year and a half. The biggest legwork is on the other side of maintaining that relationship with the client, making sure the dog is being well cared for and well used 
and then maintaining that quality control because we do provide million dollar liability insurance on every dog team as well as medical insurance on every dog team. So we have a very vested interest in ensuring that our teams are out there doing the right things. Yeah, it's a big undertaking. Anything else? Yes. Where does the money come from <laughs> that you train these animals and what would be the typical cost for a puppy to graduate? Maybe you're outing me because maybe you can tell I'm the one that has to go raise it. But uh, yes, so it is an expensive endeavor as you would probably imagine. So there's two different distinctions for us financially. There's the value of the dog and the cost of the dog. So the dog is valued with every hour of human time plus all the expenses, veterinary feeding, housing that goes into them. And then our dogs are placed as assets on our financials and they depreciate as assets on our financials because we own them for life. So a dog, a service dog, I'll just give you one example, psychiatric service dog at time of placement, their average value depends on that dog's exact age, the day of placement, it's titrated down to day, but it's about $106,000 for if you quantified every hour that has gone into that dog at minimum wage. Now, real cost to our organization is about half that because of the donated inmate training time and the donated college student training time. So we can place twice as many dogs financially as we could otherwise if we had to rely on the whole life cycle being our paid trainers doing it. Does that make some sense? Yeah, and then where's the money come from? Um, anyone, everyone. Um, obviously typical things like fundraising events, um, direct mail, those types of things. And then individual donors make up the biggest proportion of our donations, um, the biggest quantity of donations in terms of dollar amount comes from corporate sponsorships. And then we have some family foundation support and we do have some state grant funding these past two years, but that's not sustained state funding. That's just um, year by year grants. So yes, it's quite the adventure. Yes. So would like your thought on um, from a healthcare facility, do you have an OR that want to take the therapy dog? Um, what's, our, what's your thought on our answer and <laughs> should we be changing that because it sounds like they have places that they No, that's a really great question. I appreciate you asking. So one distinction, I'm just going to pick a part. No therapy dog should be coming in at all. So only if the person has a service dog should they potentially be asking for access. Service dog access stops at any place that is not open to the public. So anything that is otherwise restricted due to sanitation, medical needs, visitations at hospitals, the employees only section of a restaurant. Those dogs are not entitled to go any of those places. So as I, if I, as the person accompanying that person to surgery, can't come sit in the OR and watch you, then neither can their service dog. And the service dog has to be cared for during that time by someone who can reasonably keep it under control. At no time should a teacher at a school a medical professional at an office, no one else has to take responsibility for helping with watching over that dog. So most people who are hospitalized, the service dog cannot be with them and probably only comes in with a support person to visit them and see them because if that person's hospitalized, they also can't get up every two hours, take the dog outside, get it exercise, feed it twice a day. They're admitted for a reason, right? So there, there are still very much limitations and, and power to that. The person has to be able to keep the dog under their own control at all times. So if you're under anesthesia, you can't do that. So your answer was right all along. Good luck. Awesome. Well, it's been such a pleasure to be here with you. I will be around if you have anything to chat about. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.